right about now. now, now. One, one, two, two, three, three, hit me! Right about now. Right about now. The funk soul brother. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Right About Now podcast. My name is Jonathan Small, and I am your host with the most... Did I, did I actually just say that? We got a great show today. Great show. Totally relevant to the times. A show that I needed to hear. My guest is Faye Wolf, who is a professional organizer and the author of the new book, New Order, a decluttering handbook for creative folks and everyone else. And she is going to be talking to us about a subject that is so important, how to get organized and productive in this time of quarantine. For me, one of the things that I thought I needed and then I thought that maybe I didn't need and then I realized that I definitely need again (laughs) was just setting up a schedule for myself, setting up the structure. Um, Structure is so important. It's something I, you know, teach all the time anyway but this time when there's nothing to tell you what to do or where to go or who to be meeting with I just think it's been really important for my sanity to try to follow some sense of a schedule even if I don't do it perfectly every day so one of the best pieces of advice that I got when all this started going down and we all had to stay at home and work from home is to get organized to make a calendar, to follow that calendar, and you will see your productivity increase. You will see your mood improve. You will see your procrastination recede. And they were totally right. But I felt like I knew what to do, but I wasn't sure how to do it. And that is why I called Faye Wolf. Because if you really think about it, right now we have an opportunity to get more done than we ever could before. There's actually less distractions, more focused time than we really even realize. But it's hard because most of us are working from our personal space when we're actually used to working in our professional space. I kind of work in both, so I'm a bit of a hybrid, but I know that many people are sort of at home thinking, this is what I always wanted, this is what I always wanted, and then they're like, oh my God, why can't I get anything done? There are so many ways to procrastinate when we're at home. You've got the kids running around if you got kids. You got the pets running around if you got pets. You got the spouses running around if you got spouses, girlfriends, partners, whatever it may be. There are distractions. And then you got social media. Oh my God. Social media for some reason is so much worse when you're in quarantine. I don't know why the temptation to check it is so much more, especially in these times when you feel like you sort of have to keep up to date with what's going on. So Faye Wolf's tips are going to help you boost your productivity. They're going to help you increase your concentration during social isolation. And they're going to make you feel like you're just getting more done each day. And contrary to popular belief, being a bit anal and organized actually allows you to be much more creative and free. Now, Faye is really, really good at what she does. People pay her good money for her services. Her clients include celebrities such as Emily Dachanel from Bones, Jesse Tyler Ferguson from Modern Family. I love that guy. She's got a video series on apartment therapy. She writes frequently for that site. She's also a creative herself. She's a wonderful musician and an actress. And I so enjoyed talking to her. Faye put me in a great mood. And we really enjoyed getting to know each other. Since we've recorded this interview, I actually tried a bunch of these tips. Like I've gotten Evernote and I've started to use my calendar differently. And I got to say, it like, kind of works. And if you want to see an unedited video of this podcast, all you have to do is head over to my Facebook page, which you can find at facebook.com backslash right about now podcast. You will see the full unedited version of the video here. I'm going to start videotaping and zooming a lot more of my podcast because I find that now that we're all kind of in quarantine, we're less likely 
to listen to podcasts and more likely to watch them. And I think that's because we're not commuting, we're not at the gym, and we're not doing the things we normally do when we consume podcasts. So I'm going to try this out. See if you want to watch the podcast in action. It's right there for you. All right. So without further ado, I bring you my interview with Faye Wolf. Faye Wolf, welcome to Write About Now. Thank you so much. It's so great to have you here. And I, I will admit that before we got on the call, like I, I looked at the background. I was like, I got to clean up a little bit here. So I'm talking <laughs> to like the organization guru. Like, Your background and, looks great. And by great. the way, my office, I mean, I should, it's a disaster because I share it with my son, who is a 14-year-old musician with it. There's a drum kit in here. There is guitar, mm -hmm. chords, computer, you know, synthesizer. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's like a really hardcore musician. And it's the, it's probably the smallest room in the house. It, it mm -hmm. makes no sense that I'm in here. I'm in here mainly because it's the best sound because it, it actually used to be a recording studio before we moved into this house. So oh, it wow. had been sort of soundproofed. It's totally cluttered and it's everything that it shouldn't be. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about that. But I also just think this is such a kind of disorienting time for a lot of people. And yeah, even people who, you know, generally work from home, and I do work from home, like 70% of the time, I have a I have a we work space that I go to, but I but I generally work here, you know, so being self isolated is not totally new to me. And I think probably true for, for a lot of creative folk and specifically writers. But I still think there's it's just disorienting. And I feel like there there's almost like an added level of organization that we need. Absolutely. Right now. Right. Yes. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about like. Well, what yeah. I mean, I just speaking for myself right now and, you know, working from home a lot anyway, myself, there's this added layer of, you know, something different. There's something different right now about working from home. And I have needed to implement newer structures for myself to make it work yeah um, because there's not that there's not that variety there's not that okay well this day i'm going to a client's house and this day i'm working from home everything's just shifted in the way that my brain is used to you know right. functioning i guess i can just jump into saying that for me one of the things that I thought I needed, and then I thought that maybe I didn't need, and then I realized that I definitely need again, <laughs> Yeah, was just setting up a schedule for myself, setting up the structure. Um, structure is so important. It's I something I you know, teach all the time anyway, but this time when there's nothing to tell you what to do or where to go or who to be meeting with, I just think it's been really important for my sanity to try to follow some sense of a schedule, even if I don't do it perfectly every day. I'm so glad you're saying this because it's exactly really what I want to talk to talk to you about. Organizing your time right now is so important. Yeah. And I feel like it's been one of the keys to my keeping somewhat sane during this very un insane time is, is, and I don't generally keep a very rigid calendar. It's always been one of the mm -hmm. things that I know I should do, but I don't do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think in talking to my therapist, it was one of the best <laughs> <laughs> bits of advice that she gave me was like, keep a, keep a calendar. Yeah. And, and I thought that that was so, it, it was so hel it, so helpful for me. So I want to share it with my listeners too, because I think that it seems so rigid to, to keep a calendar and kind of, especially for creative people. Like I don't do, you know, I do it on my own time and I work at four in the morning and I do this, but you really have to structure your day. Otherwise you are oh, yeah. so distracted during this time. Oh Yeah. I'm all about just knocking down those myths about organization in general, being rigid. I actually think it's quite the opposite of that. I think it allows for freedom. Yeah, let's let's talk about let's that. Let's talk about you it. Know. Before we get into that, though, I want to give people a little sense of who you are and oh, kind of sure. how you got into doing what you do. Give me a little background. How did you find this line of work for yourself? Because you certainly didn't set out to be a personal organizer. Um, is that I what it's not. called technically? A personal organizer or an organization <laughs> expert guru? Tell me how you fell into that line of work. Uh, I came to Los Angeles in 2003 as an actor primarily. And uh, in 2005, after my father passed away, I realized that I needed to take more control of my life. Mm -hmm. And that instead of as an artist sort of waiting for things to happen to me and working at jobs I didn't like, that I was going to 
you know, get in the driver's seat and make sure that any other work I was doing was something that I actually enjoyed and was my own boss um, for. Right. So I didn't know what that was going to be. I didn't even know that organization as a, A, I didn't even realize that I was that good at it. And I didn't know that it was a real career. So (laughs) (laughs) I started uh, doing some light personal assisting work for some friends of mine just to sort of put out feelers in terms of what I might do with my time. And I would just automatically start organizing their receipts, their paperwork, you know, set up filing systems, because that is stuff that I naturally did myself and didn't know that other people weren't doing that kind of stuff. So when I started doing that, people were kind of immediately like, whoa, this is very helpful. You can charge money for this. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, had you always been like that? Like just a very organized kind of... Not really. About some things. I yeah. was always pretty good with paper. I definitely, in high school, I had, you know, I have these blackmail worthy photos of, <laughs> of my high school bedroom that are just right. completely cluttered. So I definitely was not always like that, which is which I hope helps people to know that it is something that you can learn. And it's not like, oh, I was just born born this way. But also sometimes people are very good at giving advice, not so good at following their own, you know, like that is very true. That's very true. You're probably very good at telling other people how to be organized, but it's harder. I'm pretty good at telling people how to like, you know, I was an advice columnist for a while for Glamour magazine. I was pretty good at giving love and relationship advice terrible at following my own advice. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. But you, I can even see in your background here that, you know, yeah. there is some order to your... And there it's, is it's, definite it, order. It is unusual yeah. for creative people, and maybe it's a stereotype, they associate creativity with being kind of a little bit chaotic and, you know... Absolutely. I mean, look, my son, who's extremely creative, is like, you know, he's... he And he's just like my dad. My dad was also a, a professional musician. And my dad just would leave things all over the house and you know, was not an organized person, got things done somehow. So I think there is a stereotype about creative people, but it's not necessarily true. There absolutely is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just, you know, what I try to tell people with that is, um, it's a stereotype and creative people like everyone else are all very different human beings. Right. You know, so for some people, it, it might actually work. You know, if you know where to find what you need when you need it, that's actually the definition of organization. So if that works for you, and the state of your life and your space isn't bothering you, Mm -hmm. then do whatever you want. Right. But if you're coming to me and you're saying, oh, I feel stressed. Oh, I'm not able to find things. I'm procrastinating on my creative work, et cetera, et cetera. And you're trying to use the excuse uh, or you're telling yourself the story of, well, I'm like this because creative people are just like this. Then I'm like, okay, let's take a step back. Yeah. You You don't have to be like that. We can work on no, it's great. Uh, it's, I mean, I story. need somebody like you at, because I I think part of first part of it is to just recognize that it could help, <laughs> you know, yeah, You're, yeah. that it's I think creative people, I say it's a lot in my show, but I think creative people really do like constraints and they really they really do like yes, ba- deadlines uh, limits and, and deadlines and yes, because they're just all over the place. Um, exactly. You know, they tend to be a little ADD. Yeah. So, OK, so you you found this calling kind of unexpectedly and you started to charge for yes. it and then you started to get some pretty well-known clients right I mean you're here in LA so how did yes. you how did you yes. kind of get into that world like how did you how did they uh, find you you know that was kind of it a lot of it was natural you know yeah. a lot of my friends had done very well as actors so right. some of my first clients were you know I quote unquote biggest clients but they were already my friends yeah and then you know, what would be great is then if they were on a TV show, they would kind of pass me around right. to the, you know, castmates and producers and the writers. Are we allowed to drop names here? Uh, <laughs> we're allowed to drop any names for people who are already sort of out there and have given me testimonials. You know, right. my dear friend, so- Emily Deschanel, mm-hmm. uh, my dear friend, Josh Radner, Jesse Tyler Ferguson gave me an amazing quote for the back of my book. You it's know, wonderful. there's yeah. lots of it helps. Love- yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It helps to have those kinds of people. Sure. I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. What's that? They're influencers, like before they there was influencers. influencers. Yeah. Yes. No. But at the end of the day, you know, people who I love very dearly and I'm just grateful that their lending their names could, you know, help, help get the word out. Of course. Yeah. But yeah. So I just to sort of end that story, you know, I sort of officially opened my business in 2006. It's called New Order. 
I had a naming competition around with my friends. My friend Rebecca Feldman came up with the winning name, A New Order. <laughs> I love New... Well, I mean, I'm a huge 80s New Wave fan, so I just right? loved I loved New Order immediately. <laughs> and right? it's, of course, complete double entendre, just like my name. Yes, of yes. Of my podcast. Indeed, exactly, right about Which now. was named by my friend, the late Adam Schlesinger, named right about now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Are you a New Order fan? I am a New Order fan. Oh, I can't say that I'm like a diehard right. know every song, but, <laughs> but yes, of yeah. course, definitely. Um, and then just the sort of the quirkiness that came after that for me was a few years later after that, I then became a, a singer songwriter to my even greater surprise. So, and then my artistic life sort of took a stronger focus towards that direction. And then it began to weave into my work even more and to work with a lot more musicians as well. And then to see how the decluttering could specifically help when you're dealing with artists who have instruments, whether mm -hmm. that's musical instruments, you know, paintbrushes and things like that, uh, or any kind of different instrument. And obviously this goes, this goes even further to gardeners and chefs and, and all the kind of instruments that we need uh, access to in order to be our best creative yeah. selves. Yeah. How did the book come about? The book came about, let me think back. Okay. So the book came out in 2016, around 2012 or so, uh, I started making videos with, uh, I partnered with Apartment Therapy, which is an incredible, incredible design blog. It really and, is. A friend of mine writes for that. Uh, our cousin, oh, great. My, my wife's cousin writes for him. Yeah. It's oh, a great, awesome. Yeah. I mean, just an amazing, amazing site. Uh, Rebecca Bloomhagen, who works for them. I met her. I actually met her shooting a music video. So everything, like everything is all connected. Yeah. <laughs> so she was helping shoot a music video that I was working on. And then we started collaborating on decluttering videos for apartment therapy. And then there were just some more press things out there and, you know, did an episode of one of those how to shows. And then uh, publishers just started to get in touch with me, which was very lucky and nothing in my life has, has, has ever worked out. So, oh. so beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there were a couple, there was a couple years where a couple different publishers had reached out and that was what got me going on starting to write a book proposal, which took me years, really. Mm. Uh, a lot of stops and starts on that. But it paid off. I partnered with Haven Entertainment here in, in LA and Rachel Miller as my manager, who is, I can't even say enough amazing things about her and how well we worked together on this book proposal. And then her finding me a beautiful agent, Catherine Latshaw. I mean, it really was, it was one of those things where I was like, huh, wow, nothing has ever in my artistic life, nothing has ever happened like, so, so smoothly. Smoothly. Yeah. It was meant and, to be, uh, I guess. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. I was very grateful for it. And um, Nina Shield at Ballantine was, ended up being my editor and she's, I, I can't say enough good things about her. And it just was a very beautiful process of getting this book out there. I was very happy with um, the choices we made and how it all turned out. So that's how the book happened. Yeah. And has the book yeah. led to lots of other things? What did the book, I know you've made lots of TV appearances and you've, you know. Well, you know, during the publicity period for the book, there was, um, there was a lot of great PR. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I worked with, I'm just like, I want to mention everyone just because like it's okay. people it's need to know that this does not happen by, by oneself. But yeah, I worked with Anderson PR for that and they were incredible. And we got a ton of uh, beautiful press articles, a couple of TV appearances and stuff like that. And that was just lovely. And, you know, press is great, obviously for people to buy the product, but then as a solo entrepreneur, those are just great things to then have on your website for credibility right. later and stuff yeah. like that later. Exactly. So that was lovely. And, and I mean, the, the best thing of course was just people sending me emails and being like the book changed my life, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. And, and that was the goal. I mean, I really wanted to, it was about 10 years after I had started my business and it was really kind of the culmination of all my sort of best 
methods that I've also, you know, learned from colleagues as well. We all sort of work together. It's a very collaborative community. I have so many dear organizer friends and just kind of put my spin on it in terms of having the creativity angle as well and making sure that creative people had a book that was kind of just for them. I mean, it's really for everyone else. That's part of the title It's as well. It's part of, you know, the thing. But it, but you you have such a connection to that world, both personally, yeah. but just the way you that you know your 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 background, and I again I do think it's very important for creative people in most cases to be a little bit more organized. Um, I just think yeah. it helps. I mean, it's it it's really freeing. Helps. It's totally a contradiction that to have constraints is actually the most freeing thing that you can possibly do to do for yourself. It's so true. So let's talk, let's kind of pick up where we left off with you saying the importance right now. We are in the thick of the coronavirus crisis and we are all socially isolated and working from home and uh, going a little crazy and trying to adapt to this this new reality, which will not last forever, but really certainly is a reality now and everybody is facing it and kind of collectively. And you said the importance of keeping a calendar and I, I couldn't agree more. It's been one of the best... It, bits of advice that anybody has given me through this. I know when you say keep a calendar, though, it means maybe something different to other people. So maybe explain. And you talked about in your book, you talk about this like triangle of like calendar to do list. And what was the other thing? The um, triangle of productivity, the triangle of productivity. (laughs) I love that. And it was it was the calendar to to, to do list. And what was the third thing? again? And the email inbox, email inbox, which, oh, my God, that's a whole other topic we got to get to. But let's start with the calendar. Tell me, how should we think about a calendar? Where should we put this calendar? So there's a couple things here. I will say in terms of having a general structure for your time at home. And of course, this is going to be different if you have kids at home, if they need to be homeschooled right now, all of that stuff. If you're also working from home in your normal job where your hours are the same, then that's actually going to be maybe easier for you because you you know you're supposed to be doing things at certain times. I'll just use myself as an example. Obviously, I am doing some work from home. I am obviously not going to clients' houses right now. And I have way more, quote unquote, free time than normal. But I'm not the kind of person whose brain works in free time. Like I'm just, I'm I'm a worker. I I like like to to be be doing things. I like to be busy. I also am very into having rest time. And so that's part of my structure. But basically, I've created a daily schedule that doesn't have the specifics of the tasks. It just has the general Mm. um, times. So for instance, right now, every day from 7am to 10pm is my self care, my breakfast, taking a walk, making sure I call my mother to check in on her, and doing really anything that's time sensitive, anything that really needs to be done. That's your, that's the the first block of time. That's my first block of time. Okay. My second block of time for about an hour and a half is playing music, which is always hard for me. I mean, I'm a huge procrastinator, as I'm sure, you know, everyone is, (laughs) every artist is. Hello. Exactly. So I've created that time. It worked out so beautifully yesterday and it was like therapy for the rest of the day. We are currently speaking in that time slot, which oh, is thank fine. you for. I'm sorry. This is <laughs> no, another not kind at of all. creating. It's it's yeah. it's kind of the time slot for better or for worse that there there's got to be some give. So this is the time slot that I'm also using for something like a podcast interview, or if I'm having like a a medical phone consultation or something like that, I'll try to schedule things in that time slot. Right. Then I've got lunch and an attempt at fitness with my partner after lunch. (laughs) (laughs) Some days it works, some days it doesn't. And then I've got this three-hour block in the afternoon where I'm either speaking to a client or working on specific things for new order, whether that's working on my online course, doing admin, all that kind of stuff, writing my newsletter. And then five to seven is another walk. And then it's just like play as many games as you want, do puzzles, do crosswords, that kind of stuff. And then seven on is like dinner and watching TV with my partner or maybe doing like a Zoom call with a friend. Yeah. And is it the same schedule every day, the same 
blocks of time. Mm-hmm. Except- so I'm trying to do that Monday through Friday. Mm-hmm. And then Saturday, Sunday, I'm trying to do cleaning and decluttering projects, basically. So oh, wow. I'm trying to dig into either stuff that I've been meaning to declutter because it's a practice. It's not it's yeah. not all or nothing. It's not one and done. So even organizers have junk drawers that have piled up and things like that. But I also have a lot of, not a lot, but enough of a backlog of just like memorabilia boxes and stuff. And it may be crazy thinking that I'm even going to get to that stuff. But at least I've said, all right, you don't have to worry about it during the week. After you clean the house on the weekend, maybe you'll get to that. Maybe you'll do more relaxing. Maybe you'll watch a movie. Who cares? It doesn't have to be perfect. But that's sort of the general structure that I'm currently working with. I love that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So you know that you have these blocks of times for certain things. Do you then fill in the details? Do you ever fill in the details of what it's going to actually be? Yes. Yes, I do. And I would fill in the details as well in non-corona time. (laughs) So, Yeah. yeah. So then what I would do normally is say on a Sunday. And again, I'm just saying I'm not always perfect at this, but when I do this, it really works great. So on a Sunday, I'll sit down for about an hour and I'll go through my entire to-do list. And then I will insert in the specific, the specific tasks. I'm not going to write them in my calendar because I don't want to. Well, this is sort of a longer, longer explanation. It depends on what you're using for your calendar. I will say that in general, I would never want you to write down tasks arbitrarily on a calendar on days where you hope things will get done Mm -hmm. because then inevitably you're just crossing them out and like putting them on the next day and things like that. Right. So I would definitely have a separate task list and then a calendar. And then ideally your task list and calendar are coordinated by sort of these blocks of times where you're going to do them. And then on your to-do list, you know, hopefully you're using something where you can attach a time to it. Right. So then when the time comes, you can pop up those things. So like, let's say, for example, this morning I get up and I follow my self-care routine and then I get to my, let's say my 10 to two routine is writing something like I need Mm -hmm. to write a few articles today. So in my to-do list, would I write down, you know, okay, I definitely need to write such and such article for this magazine today. I've got to write book proposal, whatever it is. And then say like, I'm going to do this from 11 to 12. I'm going to do this from 12 to one. Like, is that kind of how I would do it? Like look over my... It depends on the person. Right. You don't necessarily need to get that specific, especially if within something that you're already specific, then that's going to overwhelm you over more, even more. Potentially, I don't know, because we also have a tendency to overestimate or underestimate how long things are going to take us. So I would say, you know, if you're on deadline for all that stuff, it depends also how you write best. If you write best finishing until you're done, and then be having the brain freedom to then focus on the next project. Or if it's better for you to say, you know what, I'm just going to do an hour and I'll be happy with that. And then it helps you to then know you've got an hour to move on. So again, it's, it's different. But I would say in general, if you have a 10 to 2 block for writing and you're actually doing it, then I don't care, you know, which project it is necessarily if you're writing and not being distracted by something else. Right, right. Then you'll get work done. I thought this was really interesting. In your book, you recommended getting a timer because... Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. And and That's like, yeah. That's thing huge. One. And that's a hard one with creative people because especially when I'm writing... Well, there's days when I'm so happy that the timer would go off. I don't mm-hmm. use a timer, but I'm going to start using one because yeah. I'm like, oh, God, I don't have to do this anymore. Thank God. I, and you, and, right. But there's that sense of accomplishment, right? Like I got exactly. through it. But of course, sometimes you're in a groove and, and I'm sure you have this writing music. I have it writing words that I don't kind of don't want to break up the groove because it's so hard to yeah. get into the groove. And maybe you can. But anyway, tell before we get there, tell us about the timer and what timer you use. You don't use like a little egg timer, right? Like you don't use one of those little I don't. So and I and I will say and we and we will get there, but I usually don't use one when I'm when I'm playing music. So okay. so we can touch on that afterward. But in terms of anything that I'm doing on my computer and or anything that I might procrastinate on. So mm-hmm. say if you are procrastinating on 
decluttering your closet and you just want to set a timer for 20 minutes and see how much you can get done and then know that you can stop. That would be a great right. way to do that. If I am on my computer doing any kind of like ugh, paying bills or admin or just anything that's grueling and sometimes creative work too, don't get me wrong. Right. But setting a timer is a game changer. It just focuses you in. And then especially if you've already said to yourself, this is exactly what I'm doing during this time because you've coordinated your calendar and your to-do list, then you press start on the timer and you are golden. You know yeah. exactly what's going on. It's the clearest thing in the world. So on the computer, I go to a site called tomato-timer.com. Mm -hmm. There are tons of these out there. It's basically a third-party website that uses the Pomodoro system, okay. which you've probably heard of before. I haven't, um, but that's hence the tomato. But okay, yes, hence the tomato <laughs> exactly. But um, but I, I haven't heard of the tomato uh, the, the, the Pomodoro system. Oh, cool. So the short version is it's a, and I'm blanking on the the the, the person's name who who created it. So forgive me for that. Um, but it's called the Pomodoro Technique. And it's this idea of 25 minute increments mm. to get your work done. And you basically do 25 minutes on and then you take five minute breaks. And then I think every four times or so you take a longer 10 minute break. Sometimes I'm only doing two Pomodoros. So I might not get to like the longer break just because of how I've scheduled my day. I actually do use it when I'm writing, uh, like when I wrote my course material and when I wrote my book. So it also depends on the kind of writer you are yeah. and what your deadlines are and all that kind of stuff. And I did not mind that interruption during those processes. So in fact, I, yeah, every single time I would write my book or my course script, I had that. You would use the Pomodoro. Yeah. That's so interesting because I was going to ask you how long the blocks of time should be because you, you read these different things like people can only be truly focused for like an hour and a half or something. And then they, you know, like deep work. There, there, there's these books that have come out about how long you can stay focused, deep focus. Yeah. Um, but Pomodoro basically, and what you kind of believe these 25 increments have been really helpful for you. Yeah, I think they're really helpful. It's just such a easy amount of time. Like, how can you say no to 25 minutes? You know, <laughs> maybe that's why sitcoms are all 25. But maybe yeah, exactly. TV was so, like onto something with like people's right. attention spans. Right. That's so true. <laughs> But you said you don't use the timer when you're being doing your music. And why is that? One, I would be recording and I wouldn't want the timer to come into, like <laughs> yeah. if I'm songwriting, I'm, I'm right. recording all the files. And so it wouldn't be the end of the world because those files are just for me to listen over to, to craft a song. But, I, you know, I'm not sure why that's, uh, other than that, it's a good question it might actually help me more. No. <laughs> well, I mean, I think about myself. A, you're in a groove, so you don't want to disturb it necessarily. Yeah. You know, writing course materials and stuff like that, it's sort of something, nobody really like loves doing that. I think you, right. and so it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But when you're like writing music and just being free, I feel like, or when I'm doing like a podcast editing, which to me is kind of fun, like I don't need a timer because I feel like I'm sort of enjoying it anyway and it's therapeutic and I don't, Right. it's not like drudgery. <laughs> I, there's a lot yeah. of things we do in the day that are not so fun. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I need the timer. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, that you just makes have you to do it. Know yourself. Yeah. You have to know what you enjoy. Okay. I think that's so useful. Let's talk about separating the calendar and the to-do list. You had mentioned on your to-do list that there's there's two to-do lists. There's like the action items, which are things that you really have to take care of. They have deadline mm -hmm. sensitive. And then you said the um, you reference. Said reference. Reference items. Well, explain the difference if you could. Yeah, totally. So, and, and the reference, I wouldn't even classify as part of a to-do list, but I think that people do have a tendency to just put everything on a list. So the differ differentiation, is that a word? <laughs> is as follows. Um, so tasks on a to-do list, like you said, anything that is an action that you need to take, anything that's a project that you know falls under the steps of a project that you're working on that actually needs your attention. Whereas a reference item is like the medication that your parents are on so that you know 
if somebody asks um, yeah. the phone number for the restaurant that you love in that town that you visited one time that you don't want to forget about. Those are reference items. Those aren't things you have to take action on. They're just there for you if you need to reference them later. And I think a to-do list, if you're putting reference items on a to-do list, you're inviting clutter into a space that doesn't need to be there. So I'm all for separating those two things out so that when you look at your to-do list, you know that those are actual actions. That's great. I think a lot of people, certainly creative people, you're, I'm always having ideas like, oh, that's a great book idea. And, and yeah. th there's like these, when am I going to get to that? And then you you get distracted, you get pulled away from what you were supposed right. to do. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to start writing this thing and I'm going to do this. And I get very, that's kind of gives me that nervous, anxious feeling because I'm always being pulled away from what I know I need to do by that is things such that a I, great example. That I want ideas. It to. Yeah, it's ideas. Yeah. And so it's a good to have a separate place for your ideas that you're going to act on. Maybe you even make a separate place in your calendar to look at those ideas. Like when do those, you don't want those ideas to fall away. Like I had this book idea right. the other day while I was reading a book. I was having a book idea and I was like, this is incredible. And I went on this like down this rabbit hole for like two hours of like researching this book idea and everything. And then like inevitably when you have these ideas, you're very excited at first and they kind of like, when you realize it's going to be kind of hard, you you get less excited. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe I won't. in 10 years. Yeah, maybe in 10 years I'll write that. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I ordered all these books, reference books, and everything is coming in Amazon. I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, two, you know, two days ago, I was so excited about this idea. <laughs> so for the, when, when, do you, when do you refer to your reference list? Like, how do you? So I will say that there are, um, I happen to use Evernote for my reference list. Mm -hmm. And there are so many apps out there right now that For have not only this functionality, but so much more. And I, you know, I don't want people to get overwhelmed with all the choices out there, but I know. Evernote is one of them. You know, Notion is one that people are loving right now that I've looked into a little bit, but there's just so many places. It could also be a separate notebook. You know yeah. what I mean? It could be an analog situation, but I'll just say what I use is Evernote and I interact with Evernote on a daily basis. So I'm interacting with Evernote almost as much as I'm interacting with my to-do list. It's just another place that I trust for information. So that's where I put all my lyric ideas. If I come up with a lyric mm. just on a Thursday at three, I immediately open up in my phone Evernote and it pops into my lyric ideas. Oh, that's so cool. So you have different folders within. for different. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's basically the equivalent of a filing cabinet. It's a digital filing cabinet. Yeah. Because anything you're putting in an analog filing cabinet, that's also going to be reference material. Hopefully, that's yeah. what it should be, right? But it's hard to you're find. Analog to me is a notebook, right? Which was what we used to do in the old days. And you can have all these notebooks. And I, I found notebooks recently have all these ideas written in them. It's like, I'm never going to. Yeah. It's In right. some ways, it's nice to have a, a digital uh, it's easier yes. to access. Yeah. That's what works for me. That's where I, I put love it. I'm going to try it. Yeah, I've got so much stuff in there. I've got all medical records, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've been there. using, and I don't think it works. And I think you mentioned this in your book. I don't know if it works that efficiently. Notes, like, you know, so I have, I'm a Mac guy. So yeah. I have an iPhone and they have this notes app that's been there forever. Right. And it, but the thing is, it gets lost because, the, you know, it's just yeah. day by day. And like, I'll just write down all these notes and then I don't even know how to find those notes. And Exactly. So it's ever, ever not, not as robust an app as you want for something yeah. like that. What do you use? What app do you use for your calendar? For my calendar, I actually use iCal. Okay. You just put... Yeah. And you don't really... Because your calendar is already... You probably don't refer to your calendar. At this point, it's kind of in your head, right? Kind of what your schedule is, your daily I schedule. I refer... You know, I don't trust my brain much. <laughs> okay. So I write everything down. Not only do I look at my calendar. I mean, I don't look at my calendar as much as I look at my to-do list just because right. I have a pretty good idea of, of what I'm doing. But I use iCal. I also use it in conjunction with an app called Fantastical on my phone just because mm. I find that it's a little more user-friendly in terms of inputting data. Just, just an aside. Yeah. Um, but I do use okay. iCal and I use the iCal desktop version on my computer. And I also, if it's something like a, a one-off thing that I might forget that's not a part of my usual calendar, I will use the alert function in there so that an alert will pop up, you know, 15 minutes before or the dentist appointment that's 
so random. You know, I will have that pop up uh, a day before just so I don't forget to go to the dentist, mm-hmm. things like that. But I do use a cal- my calendar. I use iCal. And then Evernote, as I said, for my reference and items. Your, and for your action to-do list? For you... my action to-do list. And this may change by the yeah. time. <laughs> by the time this goes live. Yes. Because <laughs> I have definitely used a couple different apps over the years. And I used paper for a long time. And then I went digital. And then I switched to a bullet journal last year. And that was working great for me for a while. And then I switched back to, to digital. Currently, I'm using an app called Tick Tick. Mm-hmm. Not it's TikTok, tick, 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 tick. Not TikTok, <laughs> but TikTok. Tick. The free version is is pretty great. You know, you need something that's simple enough that you don't have to go through a bunch of training videos to learn mm. how to use. It's like, well, all I need is another program I need to exactly. learn how to use, right? You don't need yeah. to learn a new thing. So they make it, it's, it's, I wanted something simpler and that had basic task list functionality. So that means things like, being able to assign a date to something, Mm -hmm. uh, being able to have different projects, you know, tasks within projects, folders, essentially. And it's all on your desktop too. And it's, and it's coordinated with your calendar. Yeah. Yeah. It's not synced with my calendar. I just coordinate it manually, but it also has functionality. Like it'll pop up the things that are for today and for tomorrow which is huge for me. So basically, if you're assigning dates for things and you don't want to forget something, especially if you're not doing a weekly review, a weekly review, like I was talking about doing the Sunday thing where you sort of plot everything out for the week, that's a game changer. But if you're not able to stick to that, at least you've got the backup of having assigned dates to things and then having them pop up in the today or tomorrow field, which you cannot do on a notes app. I know that in your book, and of course your book was written a few years ago, you had recommended that the app that comes with the iPhone, which I had uh, installed after I read your book, which is also kind of a to-do, I think it's called Reminders. Did you find that helpful? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I actually used Reminders for a while after I wrote the book. Reminders is great. The only reason I stopped using Reminders, and maybe they've fixed it by now, but the last big operating system update reminders stopped syncing between my phone and my desktop. Ooh, not good. Yeah. It was a major bad. Yeah. So instead of waiting and trying to figure, like I tried to figure, I I gave it like two hours to try to figure out. And then I was like, I'm done. I'm just going to transfer all this. And, you know, obviously Apple, well, I don't need to. Right. Apple is great for their company. And they (laughs) They do. Yeah, we won't. (laughs) Yeah. This podcast brought to you by Tick Tick and I, I was <laughs> just thinking I, for see, Apple if I had my then... Evernote open right now, I would probably which I'm gonna start using, I'd probably write down call Tick Tick about getting sponsorship because it seems like <laughs> yeah. you know, why aren't they sponsoring my podcast? It's like writers would love that kind of an app. Absolutely. Um, all right. Let's get to the bane of my existence and I'm so glad that you called it out, email. <laughs> and and really email slash social media. Yeah. But we'll start with the email because there is a way to organize your email. Email is really, it's a drug and Mm -hmm. it is, I have a few gigs right now. And so I'm getting a a lot more email than I've ever gotten because one of them is like I'm editing a a, a website. So there's every publicist in the world is sending me press releases. My email inbox has gotten just absolutely completely unruly to the point where Uh. it's terrifying. And I, and I, so I'm getting in, for that job, and then from another job, I get another whole set of PR. Email. Anyway, everybody has their own email issues, but I hate it, <laughs> and I'm always <laughs> behind on it. And if I showed you my email box, this is embarrassing because it's like there's hundreds of emails, and I'm a pretty organized person in terms of answering people. And but anyway, yeah. you had so many good suggestions of how to manage the onslaught of email that we have. I've had other people on the podcast that um, recently had a, I had a woman on who said that she started doing like automated responses saying like if it's really important you got to call me and you know only checking twice a day and but Mm -hmm. but but let's break this down a little bit in your calendar do you have a special time for answering email is there like have you set aside certain times of the day where you're going to look at email and the rest of the day you're just going to avoid email so in general and depending on what period I am like if I'm about to launch something or you've got these projects going on where I know that there's 
more email, uh, I will either set aside specific times a day for email and or do what your other guest said is for almost all of fall 2019, I had an, uh, an auto reply mm-hmm. on both my personal and my business. Because it was just was, too much. It was too much. Yeah. It was too much. I was working on, you know, I was trying to be in deep project mode and it gave me the peace of mind to know that people were responded to, that they weren't left out hanging and that they had the option to get in touch another way or I would give them my virtual assistant's email address as well if it was, you know, really important, if if they didn't have my phone number. But I was like, basically, if you don't have my phone number. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're going to send me. Yeah. If you're going to send me a mass email that you're sending 500 other journalists, like I'm not even going to. Resp- I almost wish I could say that. Like I am not going to respond. Yeah. To no. And person. especially, yeah. If those are the kinds of emails, that's like an easy no thank you. But then there are also other things you can do. So, you know, it would depend, of course, on your specific email. But lately I've gotten really into filters mm-hmm. in Gmail. I don't know if you use Gmail, but a lot of the Gmail. bigger you do. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the, you know, Yahoo, Hotmail, they've all got a filtering system. Most most providers do. But filtering has been great lately. So definitely if it's a sender who you've only gotten these emails that are going out to 500 journalists at the same time, you know, you can set a filter so that that e- either automatically gets deleted or just moves to a different, you know, automatically gets archived. So you don't yeah. have to see it or you can make sure that the ones that are, you know, the mass emails get filtered, but not the ones that are specific to you. If there's sort of a keyword, you can add into that stuff like that uh, ways to, get out the clutter first of all so that so that all you're left with is is stuff that you might be interested in or might have to reply to so the auto replies the filters um what about snooze over. have you been using the snooze book? oh yeah that's snooze kind of a new, i don't think snooze was there when you wrote your book but but tell that's me about correct. tell me about snooze because i know another yeah. person i talked to recommended snooze snooze is like I i'll get to snooze. it yeah. yes I, i'm using snooze all day every day i yeah. basically And what I like, one example of how I use snooze is I try to do my own budgeting and accounting stuff on Mondays so that I, that I might get, um, you know, credit card alerts that I want to get so that I can, cause I like to sort of manually go into my bank account and budget Mm -hmm. and make sure things are checked off. So obviously they're not all coming on Monday, so they'll come whenever they come and I have a filter set so that certain emails like from Chase and American Express always get labeled with a label that says reconcile. And so then as soon as those come in, they've already got the label. And then I will manually snooze them to come back on Monday. Mm. So they're all gone out of the inbox. That's one example. Obviously, unsubscribing. Unsubs- okay. So you mentioned that just unsubscribe to pretty much every email list. Yeah. Except mine, except the right except, about except both of ours. Yeah, except the new order. <laughs> right, everybody. <laughs> oh, but I I know. No, but honestly. And and if look, if if your emails and my emails are not serving people, then they should absolutely right. unsubscribe. Yes, to I will not well. take it personally. I try to not make mine all. helpful. And and I know that I have I'm way too subscribed and it's become easier to unsubscribe, I've noticed. Um yeah. beyond just scrolling down to the bottom of the email, there's actually like it seems to be a command now on, on my iPhone that enables me to unsubscribe. Yes, there's now a shortcut that did yeah. not exist three years ago. Right. Ex- so exactly very true. important to unsubscribe. Um, set time limits. Don't you don't check it every hour, every 10 minutes. Make a time. Um, yep. You, you're very into archiving, right? You don't delete, but you archive. So it I archive. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's there if you need to reference it, because that's happened to me in the past where I got to need to go back and, and reference stuff. Do you have different Absolutely. folders where you put or maybe that's your filter where you put different types of emails. Like if you get an email that's for new order, it goes in your new order folder. If you get an email that's for your music stuff, it goes in your music folder. Like Only really filters at this point. Okay. And filters I actually only started using to the extent I am now I this past use filters. year. So they, they act as folders essentially. And for me, it's, it's, it's less about going back later, but more about just the active emails in my inbox 
it's quicker for me to know what category they're in. Sometimes I think if you're taking the time to add things to a folder, it depends on what it is. It's not always necessary. So you want to just make sure that whatever organizational things that you're doing in your email inbox, that they're actually working for you as opposed to this illusion of organization. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know, but it can work. Absolutely. Okay. Last thing you mentioned a a virtual assistant, and this is kind of a new concept that's come to my uh, awareness over the last few months. Um, uh, I didn't even really know virtual assistants existed. I thought a virtual assistant was actually literally a virtual, like like a, a robot that was a robot, you know, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Tell me how you use a virtual assistant. It seems like it might be expensive. I don't know, like you know, to actually have a human being doing stuff for you. But how how do you utilize your virtual assistant? Because I have I have a fantasy of having one, but I have to justify. Yes, it. Yeah. absolutely. And I actually talk about this both in my book and my course as well, just because I believe that utilizing other people is a form of decluttering your life and having it flow better and being Mm -hmm. more efficient so that you can do the things you want to do. So for a long time, for longer than some people might think I should have because of my financial situation, but for a long time, I've had an in-person, very, very part-time personal assistant And she has helped with things like dropping off donations for clients Mm. when I get just like a bunch of donations in my car or picking up packages for me or, you know, going to the post office, things that a normal assistant would do, which has made sense for me because that time has then been used to make my life more efficient, either to earn more income or to simply rest so that I'm better rejuvenated to then earn more income and make more per hour than what I'm paying my assistant. And then about a year ago, I added uh, a virtual assistant who is based on the East Coast. And she has primarily helped me get my online course off the ground and also helped me with website admin. So like, you know, when this podcast comes out, she will go and grab the link and put it on my website, right. things She'll like that, that, that I don't personally have to do. Right. That's Does she help with your social life. media stuff? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I'm a little, I mean, social media is a whole other thing where I right. like, don't care and who knows if I'll ever care more. But <laughs> but yes, for most people, <laughs> yeah, that would be, a virtual be assistant would also help with social media. How did you d- figure out what were the things that you needed her to do as opposed to what you want to do yourself? Does she help you with the things that you just don't feel like you're good at? Yeah. Or- so it's basically, I would, you know, take a look at my, at my task list and say, what are the things that I either have to do myself or really love to do? Mm-hmm. Like for instance, like I love making, I love making web pages. And when I was working on, for instance, like the, the sales page for my course, I actually love doing that. I love like choosing the colors and doing all the copy and all of that. So some people hate that. So they would have a virtual assistant do that, but I happen to love it. So it's either if it's something that I have to do myself or that I love to do, I will keep those tasks and everything else I will hand off. I think Mm. that a lot of people, myself included, have control issues and also (laughs) obviously the money, you know, you feel like, which goes so deep, which is never just about the money. I know for me, it was also just about like, am I, you know, worthy enough business person to, right. to have someone else justify help me? having somebody? Yeah. I don't make enough money to justify this or yeah, this is like a luxury. Yeah. Right. But I think you do have to look at it as this person is actually helping me make money because it's a, it's enabling me to focus on things that are important Absolutely. for me. I have to get a virtual assistant. How do you um how did you find your virtual assistant? Sure. So I went to a site called the virtual savvy. Okay. The, the virtual savvy.com. Yeah, so that is a website um this woman named Abby Ashley. She helps people come, become virtual assistants. She has an amazing course and but she also has a place where us lay people can go <laughs> and 
um, there's like a referral system. So I'm not sure where on the site that is right now, but it's okay. But people should look uh, at the virtual site. This podcast brought to you by the virtual site. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm finding all these potential sponsors. <laughs> That's really helpful. I'm sure there's probably other websites, but um, yes, just there are. And you know, ask your friends, word of mouth, all that stuff. They don't have to be on the other side of the country, the other side of the world. They could be next door to you. Is there a reason just... that you? You didn't did you didn't consciously pick somebody in the East Coast? Is it because it's they're up earlier than us? Or no, it just no, happened to be No, I do think it's it's sometimes it's helpful, but then mm-hmm. sometimes it would be helpful for them to be in the same time zone. So uh, that definitely did not have to do with it. She was simply the best candidate. Yeah. I'm sure before you reached out to this virtual assistant, you had an maybe a list of yes. tasks that you would have this person do and then you kind of align that with their strengths and, and expertise. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's really cool. I love this. These are all such great tips, Faye. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. So it's so helpful. I, I remember last time I talked to you a few years ago for an article, you had you turned me on to this last pass because another Oh yeah, great. Another big time suck for me was always forgetting passwords for what the millions of subscription services I have. And by the way, that was one of the greatest tips I've ever gotten. I Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. That is, Last yes, pass. I'm just about to send out a newsletter talking about um, passwords. Uh, I use 1Password and LastPass is another great one. And I'm about passwords and budgeting that those What's the budgeting? the budgeting? Wait, give me one. Give me one tip before we go. Because yes, every time you yes. give me tips, I use I'm going to I've got oh, Evernote good. on my list. OK, so since my book came out, yes. I my life has been completely changed uh, in the realm of budgeting by starting to use an app called YNAB, which is short for you need a budget. Okay. It is the game changer of my life. Oh, like wow. it is, I, I know that people say that a lot, like, oh, this book changed my life, this thing changed my life. Honestly, it's my life before YNAB and after YNAB. Wow. I now have control of my money in a way that I did not for the first 30 something years of my life. And now Interesting. I do. YNAB. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the kind of elevator pitch of YNAB is what? The elevator pitch is you are able to see every dollar and give each dollar a job. This is, this is some of the, some of the stuff that they say. So I'm using their words, but basically you have control of your money and you can see it all in a way that I was never able to do with like Excel spreadsheets mm-hmm. or analog. I will say, uh, unlike Tic Tac, YNAB has a pretty huge learning curve. Okay. And I wanted to quit so many times and I'm so glad that I did not. You stuck with it. I kept pushing along. I watched all their videos. I read every email that they sent in their like automatic, you right. know, you didn't unsubscribe thing. there. Yeah. I did not unsubscribe. Right. What does it help with? You just know where your money is. You're not as anxious about your money. Exactly. All of right. those things and so many more. I now just interact with it almost every day. I'm just saying, okay, this amount of money has come in. And then I've basically, then I'll budget each dollar of that down to zero. So wow. I know exactly where all that money is going to. Or you can budget it into, you know, an emergency fund or into money that's going to go into another kind of savings. But, you know, your goal is to then be budgeted out a certain number of days and uh, know exactly what you're spending and, and have a budget for a dollar amount for every single category in your life. And then you can also have like not miscellaneous, but basically there's like a stuff I forgot to budget for category. So it's, it doesn't have to be super rigid and you can always switch things around, but you're able to see and interact with everything. And it's just complete control over your finances. I love it. Yes. Hey, this has always been, as always, incredibly illuminating and helpful and so many things I got to do. So many things to put on my to-do list. <laughs> Take your time. Small, <laughs> imperfect Small. stuff. If people want to find out more about you, tell us a little bit about how do they find you? What do you offer? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, my sort of main website for all of the things I do is feywolf.com. There are no E's in either my first or last name. I know. It's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I keep it. Your you know, whole life. Yeah. I'm sure you've gotten that. Yes. Um, and then my decluttering specific website is neworderlove.com. 
And the thing that I'm doing most with people right now is I, of course, love to have people join the email list if that's helpful for them. And what I've been working on and will relaunch again soon is my online course, which is basically the book, you know, times times 10 in terms of taking those concepts and then actually teaching you and showing you how to do all that stuff and then having some access to me as well for questions. And uh, yeah, and then my music website is feywolfmusic.com. That's wonderful. I think that's, that's about it. I'm going to take you out with one of your, I'm going to take this out with one of your songs. What? Oh what, my which, goodness. Which one, which one should it be? They're all so sad. Th- they're sad. <laughs> well, I'm feeling kind of sad these days, so it's probably a good... Oh gosh. Uh, let's see. The, the most recent release, why don't we do that, which is uh, a single that called These Kids. These Kids. I love yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Here's These Kids, faywolfmusic.com. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. Thank you so much. Uh-huh.